Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Marion Snively. I work for the Alaska Department of Fish and Game as a wildlife education specialist. And today we have Will, um, Will Newberry to give his presentation on big hunting, a big game hunting in Alaska. Will was born and raised in Sedona. Um, he's a lifelong resident. He grew up hunting big game and small game. He's harvested moose, caribou, and lots of small game. Um, he received his Bachelor of uh, Wildlife Biology from UAF in 2010. He's been with Fish and Game, and I didn't realize this, Will, since 2005. That's when I started. Yeah. And, um, but he's been with the Wildlife Conservation since 2011. And um, we also have Sierra here. Sierra, you want to introduce yourself? I would love to. Hi, everybody. My name is Sierra Doherty, and I am Marion's counterpart up in Region 4, which consists of Palmer, Glen Allen, all the way out to King Salmon and Dillingham education specialist. And tonight I will be acting as the chat wrangler. So I'll be watching for comments. And um, if you have any questions along the way, please feel free to type them in the chat. And if Will hasn't addressed them during the presentation, we'll make sure to ask them at the end. And I've I've already seen one comment and that's from William that he can't hear. So I, if someone else can type in just to make sure that they can hear, it might be um, just an audio preference on your end, William, because I'm able to hear just fine. So maybe check your audio settings. And, um, but otherwise, if everyone can remain on mute, looks like other folks can hear, that's great. Okay, all right. Let us know, uh, just to let you know, this video will be recorded and I will um, type in the chat where you can find the look for the video on YouTube and Vimeo. And so uh, if there's any problems with audio, uh, you will be able to watch this again in the future. Okay. So we're going to hand it over to Will. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Will. I work at the Anchorage office. I've been there for the last three years. Uh, prior to that, I worked in the Palmer Fish and Game office doing wildlife. I've also worked for sport fish and calm fish, mostly in South Central, but going to school in Fairbanks, I've been all over the state and I get to talk to people about hunting all over. So this is just kind of a primer for people who have not done a lot of big game hunting or maybe you've never been big game hunting before and just kind of to get the wheels rolling on everything and to get you started the best that we can. So we've got these species here in our state. These are the primary big game species, which are moose, black bear, caribou, brown bear, doll sheep, and mountain goat. Uh, we also have black, black tailed deer and elk in some of our southeast and uh, down on Kodiak. Um, those aren't quite as much of a, a beginner hunt because of the remote locations. Um, we're mostly going to focus on moose and caribou today because when people think of Alaska, that's typically what they think of. And that's what most people will start their hunts out with. So you want to go hunting. You're in Alaska. That's what lots of people like to do. The very first thing before you go hunting is you're going to have to have a hunting license and you're going to have to have a permit for not only the species, but also the area that you're hunting. Uh, we have 26 units within the state and the majority of our units are split into different subunits and each of those units and subunits have their own season dates, different regulations, bag limits, and all sorts of varying uh, boundaries and restrictions on them. Um, you can come in and talk to any of our fishing game offices throughout the state. We have an office in most of our major cities. Um, you can also go to a lot of our vendors, which can be places like Sportsman's Warehouse or Cabela's, uh, Fred Meyer's Walmart, and they can get you set up with some of the basics. For the specifics, I would highly recommend talking to Fish and Game because that's what we do every day. Um, the general season hunts, um, also called harvest tickets or over-the-counter tags, are available at any time throughout the year. Um, there's unlimited numbers. You can pick one up and go hunting any place that tag is good. Uh, the other thing that most people are interested in are the drawing tags, and that's our lottery system that we have here. And the application for that, which is actually coming up in the month, goes from November 1st through December 15th. Those are our restricted hunts. Um, a lot of them are gonna be like our antlerless cow moose tags out in the valley, a lot of the Kodiak brown bear tags, a lot of the sheep tags, um, things like that. Um, they're usually either close to town or there's a limited number of animals in the area, so that's why we restrict it to that lottery. 
Uh, Alaska does it as a pure lottery and it's a totally random drawing. We don't do preference points. So it doesn't matter if you've been here for 50 years or if this is your first year putting in, you have the same chance of drawing a tag as anybody else. Uh, the registration hunts are like general season harvest tickets over the counter. They're a little more restricted. Uh, we typically run a quota on those hunts where we want people to get out and hunt them. Um, so we don't restrict it like the lottery, but we don't want as a lot of animals harvested. So we usually have a quota for like the 40 mile caribou that once we hit that number, then we will shut the hunt off. Uh, tier one and tier two hunts are a lot more specialized. Uh, they're more subsistence hunts. Um, if you want the details on that, um, contact either Anchorage or Palmer. Those were most of the tier one, tier two hunts uh, are out of, and we can get you a set on the details on that. Um, some hunting units, um, mostly along the road system, uh, will require basic hunter education. Um, that's required for everybody who was born after January 1st, 1986. We also have some hunts um, in some areas um, that require for everybody, regardless of your age. Um, and we can get those set up for you as well. Um, one nice thing about Fishing Game is on our website, if you go under our hunting section and click on maps, you can find maps for all of our hunts. Um, and we have not only a PDF that you can print off and take with you, but we also have a GIS option that allows you to zoom in, look at different drainages, look at the boundaries, and turn on and off some special restrictions. Uh, it's really handy for figuring out an area and exactly where the boundaries are at, just in case you're curious about any of that. Other options for maps are the USGS website. Uh, there's a Nat Geo Topo program that you can order. And if you're really interested in a lot of private property versus state land, Fish and Game doesn't deal with any of that, but the boroughs do. So the Matsu Borough, the Kenai Peninsula Borough, or the Anchorage Municipality, they all have maps available on their website that show the state lands versus private lands versus the native corporation lands and all those varying land ownerships. If you're having trouble finding those areas, call those specific entities or you can call us at Fishing Game and we can get you started on that as well. For those of you who like using your smartphones or iPads, Garmin has made a program um, called OnX, and that is pretty good. What they do is they take a lot of the data from Fishing Game and also from the different boroughs and combine it. So that way you can see a live feed on your phone or your, your tablet of exactly where the private and public lands are at. It is only as good as the data that they receive. So sometimes it can be a little out of date, but it's a really good place to start. So this talks about some of the land ownership. You can see by the variety of colors, Alaska split up into a lot of different owners. Most of it is gonna be state or federal, but the closer to the road systems you get and the closer to the major cities you get, the more private land shows up. Um, Anchorage doesn't have a lot of hunting opportunities because the private lands, the farther away from every place you get, the more opportunities you're gonna have. With Alaska, we've got some special areas um, that a lot of other states don't. Our national preserves, you're actually allowed to hunt in. A lot of places out of state, you're not, but we split them between parks and preserves. The parks like Denali National Park, Wrangell St. Elias Park, those are totally closed, all hunting, trapping, and fishing and everything. However, a large section of those areas are also preserves, and those we're allowed to hunt in, and that's just to kind of help keep Alaska going as it was uh, back before the federal government bought us. All state land you're allowed to hunt on, majority of borough lands you're allowed to hunt on, um, anything that's undefined, any of these state systems, those are typically state lands, you're allowed to hunt on all that as well. There may be some restrictions on motorized access uh, or, you know, times of years you can use motorized vehicles and things like that, but in general, hunting itself is allowed. So you've got your tags, your license, you've looked at where you can go hunting, you're allowed to go hunting there, and now what are you gonna take hunting with you? The biggest thing is gonna depend on how you're gonna get out in the field. A lot of people, if they're just starting, they don't have big side-by-sides or trucks or planes or boats or things like that. They're gonna be hunting from their vehicle by foot. Uh, that's the way I primarily hunt, um, and it's a lot of fun, but it's also a lot of work. So the biggest thing is if you get something, you're gonna have to get it back to the road. And so you're gonna to need to have a frame pack of some sort. A regular backpack is not gonna have the support that you need to haul out a couple hundred pounds of meat from a moose or a caribou or whatever it is that you harvest. So you're gonna need a strong, sturdy bag that's gonna be very comfortable. You're also gonna need a way to harvest that animal. 
So most people are going to use a rifle. A lot of people do like using a bow and we do have some areas that are restricted to bow hunting only. And so that's another option. You're going to need a way to skin that animal. So you will need your knives. You'll need a whetstone to sharpen the knives. Um, a lot of people will take a bone saw for processing it, um, for taking off the antlers or separating the ribs. You'll need a rope in order to tie quarters back, especially if you get a moose. You also need a way to attach it to your frame pack if you don't have a bag to put it in. You'll need meat bags to keep that meat in. Um, those are really handy for keeping leaves and dirt and bugs off of the meat and keeping it clean. If you're not going to be sleeping in a motorhome or a camper on the road, if you're going to be going out a ways, you're going to need a tent. If you're in a tent, you're also going to need your sleeping bag and sleeping pad and things like that, as well as binoculars, flashlights all those major things, and especially water and food. Alaska is a pretty wet state in most places, but unfortunately, Girardia also is in most places, so you have to have a way, if you're not bringing your own water, to purify it. And then the same thing with the food, you have to have a way to bring your food and prepare it. Um, so for weapons requirements, we're pretty liberal here in Alaska. For bow, um, if you're hunting smaller to medium game like caribou or deer all you need is a 40 pound draw weight if you're hunting larger game like moose or brown bears then you need a 50 pound draw weight that's very light for most bow hunting uh, the majority of the people i talk to at the office they run 60 to 70 pounds for their draw weight um, for a rifle it's basically if it's not a 22 rimfire you're allowed to hunt with it um, of course no fully automatic we weapons but a lot of people like using semi-automatics um, just because it reduces the recoil a lot and they're easier to use we don't have any magazine restrictions we don't have any suppressor restrictions uh, the biggest thing we have is if you're using a scope it's not allowed to project a light you can't have a red dot red dot site that sends out something to the animal you're not allowed to use spotlights or flashlights or anything like that uh, but otherwise, no caliber restrictions. You can use a 223 or 243 all the way up to however big you want. Uh, like I was saying earlier, Alaska is a very wet state. When you're heading out, there's a good chance that it's going to rain, especially in August and September. So you're going to want to bring a tarp and trash bags to help keep things dry. Um, this is my wife with our first caribou. You can tell that the brush she's in is tall and wet. Um, having flagging tape to mark where the kill site at is very, very helpful. Uh, we were only able to get one load out that first night. So when we went back, seeing the flagging tape from several hundred yards away helped us zero in on where the kill site was at. It also let us kind of get prepared in case a bear was in that area. So that way you're not just stumbling upon it. I like using a rangefinder when you're out on the tundra. Those distances can really play tricks with you that, you know, 100 yards is actually 500 yards. And it's, it's just a good way to kind of focus yourself and double check on where you're at before you pull the trigger. Rain jackets, rain pants, um, all that hunting clothing is also really important. Um, hunk, hiking on tundra um, through the swamps or up mountains, uh, you're going to need some really good footwear um, with some strong angle support, especially if you get something you're hiking out and now you've got you know 100 or more pounds on your back. Uh, if you don't have strong ankle support, it's really easy to roll an ankle and then you're going to be, you know, in a really tough spot. Um, I like wearing a baseball hat while I'm out hunting. I don't really wear them anywhere else, but having something to keep the rain out of my eyes or the sun and the bugs and everything is, is really helpful. Um, we also like having some wet wipes. So that way, if you get muddy or if you get bloody, hopefully you have an easy way to clean up there in the field. Cameras. You can definitely take those. Most people have their smartphone on them, um, but it's always nice to have a backup camera just in case your phone dies. And then uh, having something to snack on while you're sitting on the mountain or just walking through the woods um, and just kind of keep your mind sharp with some trail mix, definitely with some chocolate so you get a little bit of an energy and calorie boost. Uh, that, that goes a long way. For our seasons for hunting, uh, the majority of it, um, especially for moose and caribou, is going to be August and September. Depending on where you're at in the state, depends on when it starts. Typically, it's mid-August to mid-September. Some start a little earlier, some go a little bit later. It really depends. Uh, there are a few areas that will have winter hunts. They're usually more remote areas, um, like out towards Bethel. They have a really late uh, November-December hunt. Um, and then we also have some of our drawing hunts that go on in the winter as well. Um, for moose hunting specifically, 
our bulls, if you're doing an over-the-counter tag, is going to be having some antler restrictions. Um, the majority of the state, probably 90% of the state, uh, that moose will either have to be a spike, which is a one point on one side, either a fork, which is two points on one side, have a total overall spread of greater than 50 inches, or have a set number of brow tines. Um, and those brow tines are either going to be three on one side or four. And again, that depends on the area of the state that you're in. Um, the drawing hunts, which I touched on earlier, you apply for from November 1st to December 15th. Those allow you to put in for some cow tags um, or some any bull tags as well. So you can pull a tag like up towards Fairbanks um, out of Healy that is an any bull or same thing out towards 16 on the Susitna. Anything with antlers would be a legal moose. You don't have to worry about if it's wide enough or have enough points or anything like that. Uh, for the registration hunts, uh, most of them you can get online and just print them off at home, but some of them you do have to come into a local fishing game office and sign up with us and then we will print them off for you. The tier two hunt, which I mentioned earlier, is a point system. Uh, it's primarily out west, um, starting on the Big Sioux and going west from there. And when you apply for that, it asks a whole bunch of questions about uh, where you live, where you get your groceries and things like that, and it scores you. And the people that score the highest are the ones that receive the permits uh, because we want to give the people who live out there and use the resource most often the chance to harvest those moose. So now where should we go? For moose and caribou, um, there's seasonal locations. There's a lot of overlap. Um, in the fall, they're primarily in the swamps or in dense trees. Um, it's been really warm in July and August uh, these last few years, and so they like getting in the swamps where they can get into a lot of that wet territory and cool down, get away from some of the bugs. Um, and also during the fall, they'll caribou specifically will head up really high and run a lot of ridges up in the mountains for the same thing. Um, they can get some cool breezes, they get away from the bugs, uh, and they just help beat the heat. Uh, during the winter, um, they're pushed out of those high country areas by the snow and so they're driven down a lot lower um, and because they just can't walk through it and they're heading more down towards uh, willow and aspen stands where they can get some feed. Moose specifically really like burned areas, so up north towards willow or recent, most recently down towards the Kenai, those fire burned areas. There's a lot of new growth coming up that the moose really enjoy because it's only you know, five to 10 feet from the ground and they can reach it a lot easier than a lot of the older growth. For judging if a moose is legal, because it can be really tricky to you know, guess if that's 50 inches or if it's 45 inches at 100 yards, um, we have a couple different options. There's a video on our website and we also have DVDs at our offices called, Is This Moose Legal? For bear hunting, we have a corresponding one called Take a Closer Look. And recently, we have added a moose orientation class for anybody who hunts moose down on the Kenai Peninsula, which is units 7 and 15. You have to go through the class, but we recommend it for everybody. It's just 20 questions on our website. You can go through. It shows you a bunch of different videos of the moose, and you get a judge if it's legal or not. It's a free class. You can take it as many times as you want until you pass. And it's really helpful for looking at some live moose and making some judgment calls. So people think of Alaska, they think of moose. As you can tell by the map, they're available almost statewide. Um, they're really pushing far north and far west um, due to a, a variety of different reasons, but pretty much anywhere that you go in Alaska, except for Southeast or Kodiak, you'll find moose. Moose are really big. Um, a walking around weight can be up to 1,600 pounds. Uh, they're a member of the deer species and they are the largest member of the deer species. They're herbivorous. They eat pretty much everything that's green. During the summer, they primarily eat grasses, sedges, leaves, and things like that. And then going through the winter, um, they can transition to eating um, twigs and branches um, and pretty much anything else that's plant-based. Um, most predators are going to be larger. They're going to be the wolves, black bears, brown bears. Uh, for an adult moose, they don't have a lot of concern for predators except for brown bears or if a pack of wolves catches one, especially in the winter when the snow is deep, uh, they could take a moose down. Normally, they only have one calf a year. They can have twins, especially if the habitat is really good and it's really producing. They can have twins, and we have seen triplets on a rare occasion, um, but Mostly it's, it's singles and twins. 
So for the valley, where a lot of people like going to hunt, it's one of the closest areas that you can hunt um, out of Anchorage. Uh, it's 14A and 14B are the units. And that legal area is either spike, a fork, greater than 50 inches, um, and this area is three brow tines. So a brow tine, I'm just gonna go over this quickly since we do have a lot to cover, um, is one of the points that emerges from the front of the antlers. Uh, and it, you don't get to add them together. If there's two on one side and two on the other, that's not four, you gotta look at just one side. Uh, we have these definitions in our regulations and all those regulations you can pick up online or at one of our offices. But a point is any projection from an antler that's longer than it is wide and at least an inch long. Um, sometimes they get a little funky and there's some rounded knobs and points, but those don't count. So like cow hunts, which a lot of people really like because it's really easy to find a moose that doesn't have antlers. Um, mostly happen in the winter. We do have some in the fall uh, and those are primarily done by our drawings. It could be kind of tricky. Um, especially if they're in a wooded area of telling a bull from a cow. Um, but the cows do have a white vulva patch under their tail, which makes it a little easier. Um, and typically the bulls up through December will have antlers that are easy to spot. So in this case, it was, the cow was here in the top right corner of that second photo. So I've got a few Quick pictures, we'll just kind of run through about is this moose legal? We're looking for the majority of the state, which is either spike fork 50 inches wide or three brow time regulation area. So this one's kind of hard to tell. Um, he's in the brush, can't really see him very well, um, but he's only got these two brow tines and he's very skinny, very narrow. He's not 50 inches. If you see a moose like this, that's almost a no brainer that that is well over 50. Um, also, if he turns his head, you can see he has three brow tines on his right and also probably four on his left. So he is a definitely a legal bull. Um, one like this gets a lot of people in trouble. He looks big, he looks impressive, but his antlers cup up really high and he only has two brow tines on either side. Um, we did have an illegal moose shot this year in a four brow tine area. He looked very similar to this one. He had two on one, two on the other person thought that meant that was four. Unfortunately, that was not correct and he lost the antlers and the meat and received a citation. So here's another little moose. Um, obviously three points on his right. The left is very hard to tell, um, but he is just two on that side. So he would be legal in a fork hunt. The other big species that people like to chase up in Alaska that you really can't chase anywhere else in the US right now is going to be caribou. They're found again throughout the majority of the state except right in South Central um, and then a Kodiak in Southeast. They've been transplanted down towards the Kenai and down on the Aleutian chain to several, several of the islands and they're a really great first species to hunt. They're a lot more manageable than a moose. Um, they're a lot more abundant than moose as well, but what makes them tricky is they never really stop moving. They're a migratory species and they're constantly going from one end of the state towards the other. An average bull will have a live weight of roughly 350 to 400 pounds and an average cow will be about half of that. Um, you can definitely Find some that are smaller, find some that are bigger. Some of the herds also have different average sizes. Um, the farther north you go, the body size gets a little bit smaller. Um, most of the caribou I've harvested, you'll get between 100 and 150 pounds uh, in the freezer when you're done. Uh, the moose, on the other hand, you'll end up with between three and 400 pounds in the freezer when you're done. So there's definitely a, a very large size difference between the two. That being said, I'd much rather pack a caribou out um, versus a moose for any distance. They have very similar diets and predators towards moose. Um, their reproduction is just a single calf. Um, I've heard of twins, but that would be very rare. And I, I really have no idea how often that happens. It's, it's pretty much always a single calf that they'll drop. 
since they're so widely spread and then so abundant, um, we have a lot of different opportunities for them. Uh, there's a lot of general season tags, uh, mostly up north and out west. Um, there's a lot of registration tags on the road system. Um, and also down a little bit closer to, to Anchorage in the Valley is gonna be some drawing tags and the tier one caribou hunt. Uh, the, all the hunts on the Kenai are by drawing only. Um, those herds are very localized and quite a bit smaller. And so we don't wanna over harvest them. Um, and here's a quick little breakdown of most of the areas for general season versus registration drawn. And then we also have some youth hunts. Uh, the youth hunts are available for any Alaska resident youth who is either 10 or set through 17 years old, as long as they have completed basic hunter education before the hunt actually starts. Those are once in a lifetime tags. So if your youth draws a youth tag, that's great. That's the only time that they can draw it because we want to give all the other kids an opportunity as well. Um, so here's a quick little rundown of sizes of all the species um, with moose in the center and then moving down towards uh, just regular deer. Um, elk are definitely the next largest um, and then caribou and then deer. Um, this is also a picture I was really glad to find of where um, the vital zones are on a caribou. Um, it kind of shows you the size of their lung, the size of their heart, and where to take a good shot. One thing, if you're out in the tundra and you come across a set of tracks and you don't know if it's moose or caribou, um, the big difference is caribou tracks are a lot more half moon shaped and a lot round, more rounded. Um, moose tracks, besides being typically larger, are a lot more pointed and their tips are usually a lot sharp, sharper. Um, doll sheep, I'll touch on this real quick because a lot of people are interested in hunting doll sheep, especially as residents. Um, they're found in most of our major mountain ranges throughout the state. We have a lot of general season tags, but most of the really coveted areas are by drawing tags only. Um, they're up to 300 pounds, but most sheep are going to be quite a bit smaller than that. Everything preys on sheep. Um, they're a lot more susceptible to predation. Um, they're also a lot more susceptible to weather events. Uh, we lose a lot of sheep throughout the winter due to avalanches and icing and starvation. Um, and ewes, just like caribou, typically just give birth to a single lamb. Uh, they're found in the mountains. If anybody up here has been hiking any of our mountains, they're typically fairly difficult to get to, especially to get all the way up into sheep country. Um, a lot of people use airplanes and kind of cheat the system to get dropped off on top of the mountains instead of putting on the legwork to get up there themselves. Weather is a major, major factor with sheep hunting. A lot of guys will go out to sheep camp and they'll spend the first five or six days just in their tent because it's either raining or it's blowing wind or it's foggy and they just can't see where to go or where the sheep are. To make a ram legal in Alaska, and the only sheep you can harvest are rams, which are the males, uh, it has to be full curl. We do have three different ways to meet that full curl regulation though, and that's either by actually being full curl where the tip passes the base, um, breaking off both sides of his antlers, or being greater than eight years old. Um, to be full curl by a circle, you have to make a circle out of the antler. And like I said, that tip has to pass the base. It's gotta be a perfect circle. It can't be an ellipse or an oval or anything like that. Um, this can be kind of difficult to see, especially out in the mountains when you're looking at sheep several hundred yards away and waiting for him to turn his head just the right direction. Uh, for both horns broken, um, that one's a little bit simpler. Um, as rams get older, those tips can get in the way of feeding or their eyesight or just from fighting, uh, they'll break off the tips of them. Um, and those are what's called broken or broomed. And once both, that happens to both sides, then that is a legal ram. Uh, to be eight years old is also a way to make a ram legal. That is a very, very difficult to look at in the field. Um, we see several hundred rams a year come through our Anchorage office. Um, Palmer does the same, and I'm sure Fairbanks and most of our other major offices see the same thing. And none of our biologists say to shoot anything on age because in hand, it's a very challenging thing a lot of times to get a proper age on these sheep, um, much less trying to do it at you know, 400, 500 yards. Um, a lot of people say they can do it. A lot of people are fairly decent at it, but it's, it's not a very surefire way to do it. Uh, due to some false annualize, 
which are rings that aren't actually age rings, um, and then just kind of miscounting at that distance. Uh, these rings get laid in during the winter because the sheep are growing throughout the summer. The winter hits and they stop growing. Next spring, they start growing again, and so you have a really hard line laid in. Um, if any of you are interested in learning more about this and actually like seeing some of them, um, our Anchorage office and our Palmer office have some sheep horns that are actually at the desk and you can come in, you can handle them yourselves and take a good look and see actually what sheep age rings look like in hand before you go out into the field. So here's an example uh, on the screen left of a full curl ram where that tip passes the base. The other one is a ram that both tips are broken off. Here's an example of aging a sheep um, that somebody shared on uh, one of the websites. This is a sheep that's four feet away from you and trying to count the annuli is very, very difficult. Um, it ended up being right at eight years old. And so that is a legal ram, but it would be something very difficult to try to do in the field. For bear hunting, as everybody knows, Alaska has plenty of bears. Uh, we have black bears and brown bears. In order to hunt brown bears, you have to be an Alaska resident. And that means you have to be living in the state full time for 12 months or longer. Uh, and then you can hunt brown bears without using a guide. Um, they're found basically statewide. Um, black bears haven't made it to the slope yet or very far out west, but brown bears are basically everywhere. Um, roughly statewide, and these are all very general estimates because it's how hard to count bears in the woods. Uh, we have about 100,000 black bears in the state. We have just under 3,000 a year harvested. We have roughly 32,000 brown bears and about 1,500 a year harvested. Uh, this is data that's a couple years old, but numbers have stayed pretty steady throughout the years. Um, if you're interested in baiting bears, which consists of placing uh, usually a 55 gallon drum with some donuts or dog food in it in the spring and waiting for bears to come in and harvesting one that way. Um, our regulations on pages 26 and 27 have all the rules and regulations on how to do that um, and how to register your bait site with us and things. Um, and then all brown bears and most black bears actually have to be sealed at a fishing game office. And what that entails is bringing in the height of the skull to us where we take some skull measurements, we pull a tooth for an age, and a lot of times we'll take some biological samples for DNA or isotope studies as well. So here's the big differences between grizzly bears and black bears. Um, it'd be really nice if every black bear was black and every grizzly bear or brown bear was brown, but that's not the case. Um, even here in Anchorage, we have several black bears that are actually a cinnamon phase, which is a brown phase. Uh, and we had several grizzly brown bears that are very, very dark brown and they're almost black. So we have to specify, is it a black black bear or is it a brown black bear and things like that. Uh, the biggest differentiation is gonna be size. Brown bears and grizzly bears are significantly larger than black bears uh, and they have a fairly noticeable hump on their back. To harvest an animal, uh, whether you're shooting a bow or a rifle, uh, the vitals are gonna be in the same place. You're gonna to wanna to take a what's called a heart-lung shot. Um, some people say to shoot them in the head or shoot them in the neck. And while that may save a little bit of meat, um, there's a very high chance of wounding an animal that way. If you don't hit them just right, um, you could, you know, they could lose their jaw or they could be wounded and lose an ear. And not just, it's just not a very, ethical way to, to take a shot. Um, by shooting something in the heart or the lungs, nothing can live without their heart pumping blood, and nothing can live without their lungs uh, moving air. Um, they're a lot larger target, they're a lot more stable, they're not moving around like their head would, um, and it's a very lethal shot. If you are gonna use a bow, you have to be mindful of where their shoulder blades are at um, and where their ribs are laying in regards to that for you know getting your arrow through. For a rifle, still be mindful of it. Um, the bullet will typically pass through a shoulder blade, but if it does that, you can lose a lot of meat to being bloodshot. Uh, so for different hunting techniques, um, there's a lot of different ways to hunt. Um, if you talk to anybody about hunting, they all have their own way that they like to do it personally. And that could be from experience, or maybe that was just how they grew up, or that's what they were watching on TV. Um, there's two main thoughts of it. There's spotting versus stalking, depending on where you're at in the state and depending on 
uh, what species you're hunting, they can have different success rates. Uh, spotting basically means that you sit there and you wait till you see an animal um, come to where you are and then you go out and hunt it. Um, stocking is where you're walking trails, you're covering ground, you're putting a lot of miles in your feet, um, trying to go to where the animal is. Um, it has varying success depending on, you know, how much luck you have with it. Um, I've done both and been successful with both. It, it really depends. Um, either way, you're going to be very uh, noticeable of what the sign is in your area. So you're going to be looking for tracks. You're going to be looking for hair. You're going to be looking for scat. You're going to be looking for signs that the animal that you're interested in and is, a, is in that area. Um, if you're hunting moose, especially later on in September, um, a lot of people will do calling. You're not allowed to use electronic calls, so no radio players or uh, CD players or anything like that. You have to do like this guy has uh, and have a horn of some sort, birch bark or plastic or just your hands, and um, try doing some calls to call that moose to where you're at. Um, there's also road hunting, which some people get really, really lucky, and they're able to just drive around and find a legal animal right from their car, but that doesn't happen very often, and uh, depending on who you talk to, that may or may not be called real hunting. So while you're out there in the field, you have to pay attention to uh, the weather and the environment. You're going to really want to watch the wind, uh, especially if you're doing um, a lot of sitting and waiting for an animal, that if that wind's blowing your scent down through the valley, there's a good chance that they're not going to show themselves or they're going to leave. Uh, same thing with sound. Wind carries sound really well. So if you're moving around a lot or if you have a loud bag or stand, um, that could be alerting the animals that you're in that area and they're going to leave. Um, and you have to really watch the sun. Uh, Alaska is um, really nice because we have really long days for the most part leading into the end of the season where sun comes up really early and then it sets really late. So you have a lot of hunting time. Um, because we lose a lot of daylight in the fall, we don't have shooting hours. If it's light enough to shoot, you're allowed to shoot. You don't have to worry about what time of day it is. Um, if that, with that being said, if you're out there in the evening, really pay attention where the sun is setting at because if this moose walks across in front of you and then the sun sets and is in your eyes, uh, then it's going to be really hard to make a good shot. You're also going to really want to remember where you le left camp. Uh, if you're going to go hike away in the morning and then shoot something and now it's midnight and you have to make your way back to camp, are you going to be able to do that or are you going to have to you know, send for help? Um, if you're float hunting, which is really popular up here, um, you're going to have to be cognizant of how long your float is, how hot the weather is, or how wet the weather is. And if you shoot an animal on the first day, are you going to be able to take care of that meat if you have a 10-day float until you get back out? All right, so you did everything right. You found what you're looking for and you shot your first big aim animal. So now what are you going to do? You've got you know, a couple hundred pounds to a thousand pounds of meat laying on the ground that is going to spoil if you're not able to take care of it right away. So you're going to need to butcher it up. What this entails is taking the hide off, taking the guts out, and separating the meat into manageable sizes to get it back to town where you can either process it yourself or take it to some place to be processed. I really like using a tarp. Um, they don't take a lot of weight. Um, they're really easy to move around and they save a lot of cleaning later. Now you lay it down and you can put the meat on it or you can use it to keep the carcass clean while you're skinning it. Um, one thing to be aware of is we have a lot of flies that can get into the meat and lay eggs if you're not watching it while you're doing all this. Uh, citrus powder or citric acid or pepper is really good for keeping those bugs off of the meat. It's not going to change the flavor at all. It's just a little orange juice or a little bit of extra pepper. So it doesn't hurt us, but it's just enough acidic to keep the, the bugs off of it. Uh, rubber gloves are awesome for keeping your hands not only clean, but also a little bit safer. Uh, they make some really heavy rubber gloves you can get at most auto stores. And if the knife slips, you at least have one layer of protection before it cuts into your skin. Um, using a rain jacket is handy, not only in case it starts raining on you, but while you're cleaning all this, it's going to be bloody, it's going to be messy, and it's nice to be able to take that jacket off and rinse it off when you're all done instead of having it all over your clothing. 
if you're going to go moose hunting, be aware that moose are really, really big. I'm sure most of you have seen moose out walking around um, and you know how tall they are, but they are very, very large animals. Um, you're looking at taking out, you know, five or 600 pounds of meat home with you. And that's going to be a lot of work. Um, this is another picture of my wife with a moose uh, in Palmer. Um, she's about five and a half feet tall and she can almost reach the bottom of his chin as he's reaching up there to eat some branches. Um, you can see from these other pictures that there's a lot of meat that you're going to have to move. Um, a big bull, their hindquarters will weigh on average 100 to 120 pounds. Um, a lot of areas in the state you are not allowed to bone that meat out. And what that means is for those hindquarters and the ribs, all the meat has to stay on the bone. You're not allowed to remove all that extra weight. You have to pull it out in one piece. So you're looking at a minimum of six, probably closer to eight to 10 trips to get that moose out. And I don't know how much working out you guys do, but moving 100 pounds times six over tundra and swamp and brush is way more work than I really want to do most days. Um, so to do a quick rundown, you're going to have to roll the animal over either on one side or on its back. Um, open up the abdominal cavity to pull the stomach and the guts out. Um, pull off the hide on one side, quarter it out, uh, and you're going to be using your knife and removing the bones at the joints um, and also pulling back straps and tenderloins out. Um, to pull the ribs off, you're able to either use a saw, which is pretty simple, um, or um, once you've done it a few times or if somebody shows you, you can actually use your knife and pop the ribs out along the spine um, and then salvage all the neck meat as well. There's a really good video on our website called Field Dressing of Big Game. Um, you can watch it and if you really like it, you can come down and uh, you can buy it from us as well. So taking care of the meat, you've done a lot of work for this. Um, you've put a lot of time and a lot of effort into it. So you're, you're gonna wanna make sure that as little of it, if any of it spoils. Um, and that's gonna be hard to do if it's raining or if it's hot, there's not a lot of ground in between. You're gonna wanna use some really high quality meat bags. Um, usually they're gonna be a cloth or a mesh and you're gonna to wanna to hang it or at least keep it dry and keep air circulating around it. Um, you don't want it to be wet and you don't want it to get hot. Um, those are both things that will lead to spoilage. Uh, a lot of people you'll see use trash bags. Do not use trash bags. That traps the heat and the moisture against the meat and it spoils very, very quickly. Um, if you're in a perfect situation, like this picture on the bottom, you'll be able to hang it in some trees. Um, it'll be nice weather, it'll be fairly sunny, it'll be cool, and the meat will hang just right. If you're someplace else where maybe you don't have trees like that, um, a lot of times you can make tripods, like this bottom picture. Um, you may have to tarp it up if it's raining. Um, sometimes what I've had to do out in the tundra hunt caribou is there's no trees and so you just find some larger willow bushes and just place the quarters on the bushes just to keep the airflow going. Um, a lot of areas if you're going to be worried about bears or if you're doing a fly out hunt or float hunt we highly recommend taking an electric fence to keep the bears out of the camp and out of the meat. Um, we've got a really good handout and educational page about electric fences and you know how to use them and which fences to use on the fish game website as well. For getting to and from the field, um, a lot of people like just using a highway vehicle. That's how most people get out hunting, but there's a lot of different options. Alaska is a really big state, a lot of different variety to transportation methods. Um, some people, they really like using horses. Um, I grew up hunting moose with horses and it's awesome. You're allowed to go areas that don't allow motorized vehicles, like a lot of the preserves and a lot of the refuges. Um, and you don't have to carry anything more than a lead rope. The horses do all the work for you. That being said, horses themselves are a lot of work and they're all, when you use them for a week, you still have to take care of them the rest of the year. Um, a lot of people like using airplanes. Alaska has the most private pilot licenses out of any of the other 50 states. Um, and a lot of that has to do with how inaccessible the majority of the state is and how few highways and roadways we have. Um, if you have a, a super cub with some nice big tundra tires on it, you can cover a lot of ground and we'll go to a lot of places. One thing that's really exploded in popularity in the last 10 years has been four wheelers and especially side-by-sides. 
Uh, the new side-by-sides allow you and a buddy or your significant other, um, or if you get a six person one, a couple buddies or you know a couple families to all go out and be able to easily haul that animal back to the road system. Um, if you head up towards north, um, there's a lot of streams and a lot of rivers that you can float. Um, you can either do a kind of a combination where somebody will fly you in and drop you off the raft and you can float your way back to the highway or you can use a jet boat or a canoe and do a float trip that way. Finally, because we're in Alaska and people like really hunting and really big trucks, you can do a moose buggy. Um, this is very specific to a few parts of the state because of some of the weight restrictions, but some guys, they really like getting some old trucks, putting some really big tractor tires on them and going way, way back in the woods. Um, they are able to cross some pretty serious streams and swamps and it gets them away from just about everybody else. Uh, that can be really expensive and you're gonna have to have a place to keep that year round as well. So you're able to get to the field, get your animal, and now you're, you've got it at home. So now what are our options for you know, doing with all this meat, what we wanted to do with it? The first thing you're gonna to to do is make sure that you can keep it clean and keep it dry until you're ready to process it. Um, a lot of people hang it in their garages or in some sheds, um, pretty much anywhere that you can keep it out of the sun and away from the bugs and keep it dry is what you're really gonna to wanna to do. Uh, while it's hanging, you're gonna go through and make sure that all the twigs and branches and moss and everything is all taken off of it. A lot of our processors here, if you bring some meat to their uh, facilities and they're dirty or you know if it's spoiled at all, they won't touch it. They'll tell you to take it home or take it someplace else because they're not gonna mess with it. Um, if something happened and it fell off the four-wheeler or a moose rolled over in a swamp or something and you got some meat and some mud mixed up, uh, you can wipe it down with a vinegar and water solution um, and that'll help clean it up without letting it spoil. For wild game, you don't really need to hang it like you would uh, with regular beef. Um, the meat with the fat being on the outside doesn't typically have to be aged quite as long. You can hang it for a week or so uh, if that's your personal preference, but usually on younger animals or on cows, that's not necessary. Uh, if you do this yourself, um, you can choose exactly how big your packages you want. Um, if you take it to a place and drop it off, then you can let them know how big a packages you want as well. Um, for a lot of people, you know, a one pound half burger package, which you get at the store, it's really manageable. Uh, most recipes call for a pound of meat or a pound of hamburger. Um, there's a couple different ways that you can wrap it if you're doing it yourself. Uh, a lot of people will wrap it once in saran wrap and then in butcher paper and that makes a really nice tight seal. That's how we've always done it. It'll keep for you know four or five years in a freezer without getting burnt or anything like that. And it's usually been just fine. Um, if you shoot something a little bit smaller or if you really like vacuum packing, you can also vacuum pack your meat. Um, that's an option. It's just totally personal preference. Um, we really like making moose burger. Um, you can add some seasonings, make it into some sausage. Uh, you can cut strips off of different pieces and make it into jerky. Um, there's always, you know, your back straps and tenderloins. Um, if you're really into, you know, cuts of meat, you can figure it out as you're taking that animal part and cutting off some chuck roasts or steaks and things like that as well. And now for the big payoff. You did all this work, you put all this time and effort into it. Now you get to cook it up. Uh, the nice thing with wild game is you can use it just like you would any meat you bought at the store and it's usually going to be healthier for you. It's free range, it's organic, no GMOs, no hormones or injections or anything like that. Um, it's going to be a lot more lean than what you would get out of the store so that's one thing to take into consideration if you're making especially burgers or some of your steaks. Sometimes you have to add in a little bit because it can be a little bit dry. Um, moose has a very mild taste most of the time and so does caribou and um, it's a lot less fatty than most beef that you would get. So if you get something that's really nice and you wanna have something to remember the hunt by and you're willing to put the extra work into it, um, you can also save a trophy. 
Um, if you're planning to do that on the get-go, make sure you have some salt or learn how to flesh the hides so that way they don't start spoiling. Um, what will happen if that hide is not prepared properly right from the get-go is it'll slip. And what that means is the hair will fall off the hide. And it won't be any good for preserving. Um, there's a lot of different options on how to preserve antlers. If you want to do um, just a basic antler mount like this one here, which is called skull capping. So it's just the top of the skull. Uh, you can do a European, which has the whole skull um, in bone with the antlers, or you can do shoulder mounts, full mounts. There's, there's a variety of options. If you're thinking about doing any sort of a mount uh, with the hide, find a taxidermist before your hunt, go talk to them, figure out how they like to have them brought in, figure out how they like their cuts on the hide to be prepared. So that way, when you bring it in, they know exactly what they're getting. If you harvest an animal early in the year, um, especially with caribou, and the antlers still have their velvet on them, a lot of places will actually preserve that velvet now. Um, that's a really unique thing that's become popular the last four or five years. Um, it takes a little bit of time um, due to the preservation process. Um, last one we got, we dropped off at the end of August and we didn't get back until February. Um, but the first one we got eight years ago and a velvet looks like it did on day one. They do a really good job and it's, it's a really neat mount. Um, here's a couple other options for bears and sheep. Um, you can make rugs, you can do half mounts, like I said, full mounts. It's, it's really whatever you can think of, most taxidermists have a way to do it. And so that's it. Um, happy hunting. If you guys have any questions, like I said, I work at the Anchorage office. You can give us a call and uh, we can help you out that way. If you're in Fairbanks or Palmer or Salatna, we have offices in all those areas as well that you can call. And yeah, we'll happy to get you started. All right, thank you so much, Will. We do have some questions that came up during the presentation, of course. And um, I think I'll go down the list here. Um, some of them are more general and some are specific to moose and caribou. And if folks have more questions as we're talking now, now's your chance to um, chat, um, enter those into the chat room. So um, one person asked, I'm not gonna use names here, but uh, what rangefinder do you use personally? Um, so I actually got really lucky. Um, right when I graduated from high school, my parents bought me a Leopold rangefinder. Uh, this is now over a decade old, I'll say. Um, it works fine. Uh, the limitation I found with it is it's reliable out to roughly five or 600 yards, which while that's way farther than I would ever shoot anything, what I use it for most of the time is actually seeing how far away something is and how much closer I have to get. So if I range it and it's 500 yards, I know I have to get two or 300 yards closer before I can start considering hunting. Um, so I've been looking at some others that'll reach out a little bit farther, but any big names uh, would be what I'd recommend. Um, Leopold, Leica, Six Hour, Vortex, um, those are all really good quality. Um, you can find cheap ones um, online or on Amazon, but when you're out hunting, you really don't want to cheap out on any of your equipment because it's probably going to fail in the field. And even if it has a good warranty, it's not going to do you any good out in the middle of nowhere. Okay, well, um, someone caught wind that there's a hunter app that's being developed by Fish and Game. So do you have any background on when that might be available? I don't know if uh, Marion can speak to that too. So I don't know when it's going to be available. I know they've been asking us some questions about it and it's not even i don't know what comes before beta testing but they've been asking for our opinions on developing some buttons and some links on it um, i don't know when that's going to hit actual stores but it should be really handy on getting your permits and tags and registrations and everything else yeah you should be able to do that all within this app mm -hmm. and um yeah i know that they're uh, they were calling out for volunteers to test the app. So, so that is kind of the stage we're at now, but um, keep an ear out for that because um, it will be a really handy tool. So regarding field care of meat, mm -hmm. uh, someone had a question about temperature. When is it too warm for hanging the meat? Uh, so typically you want to keep it under 60 degrees. Um, if it's over that, actually anything over 50, I usually put some fans on it just to keep the air circulating. 
Um, you can just think about it like you would with a steak on your counter. If you want to cook dinner and you have a steak, you're not going to leave it out at 70 degrees for very long versus if it's 50 degrees, that meat will keep a lot longer. Great. Okay, regarding moose, um, you talked about moose calls. Mm -hmm. can, do you, can you talk more specifically about moose calls and what maybe more, more effective moose calls might be or how to learn them maybe? Yeah, so um, if you watch some of our videos on the website, they get into it a little bit, not super in detail. Um, and since this is gonna be on, on YouTube and Vimeo, you can look up moose calls there as well. There's a lot of different variations and a lot of people put their own twist on their calls. Um, they'll do cow calls and they'll do bull calls. Um, doing calf calls doesn't really do much that late in the year. Uh, one thing to be aware of though, if you're going to do a bull call, which during the rut, a lot of the bulls will take that as a challenge and come in and try to find that new bull and try to run him out of his area. It can sometimes backfire for you. Uh, if you have a younger moose or a smaller moose, he may not want to fight. And if he hears another big moose calling, if he's in that area, he's going to just boogie out and and you go someplace else he's not going to want to challenge you like some of the biggest ones would so um, it works a lot of times um, we've done it especially in october uh, if you're here in anchorage you can go up towards rabbit creek or Powerline pass and find some of those bulls up there and hear them calling and see them fighting and, and do some calls yourself and see how responsive they are to them um, but it's it's one thing it, you really learn it best by just being out in the field and observing them and practicing it where nobody else can hear you. Practice in the shower. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. And a caribou question. Unit mm -hmm. 13. Don't get any questions about that, do you? Um, no, that's why, an easy place. <laughs> why do the draw? Why not just the registration hunt there? Okay. That's actually, that's a really good question. So the drawing tag, as I said, it's a lottery. There's no guarantee that you're going to win it. If you do the registration, that is a guarantee. But for Unit 13, it's a very special area being that it has roughly 40,000 caribou and it's being surrounded totally by highways on every side. It's also halfway from Fairbanks and halfway from Anchorage and it gets a lot of pressure. So with the registration hunt, they put a restriction on it where if you sign up for that registration, you have to choose if you're going to hunt in either August or September, one or the other, you can't do both. And the big restriction is that it's one caribou for the entire household, and you can only hunt moose in Unit 13, no matter what. So if you're a smaller household uh, uh, and you only want one caribou, or if you hunt moose up there anyways, it's not you know a deal breaker. Uh, but for a lot of people, especially on the Kenai or in Fairbanks, that want to hunt moose you know close to home, it's not worth it to do that registration and lose the opportunity to go moose hunting um, versus uh, you know a guaranteed caribou tag. Excellent. All right. Um, we have a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try to get to a couple more of these new questions that just popped up. So if you're not going to keep the hide, is there a process or paperwork for donating an, to an organization that's interested in the hide or other parts? I've seen a few requests for donations for Native elders. Mm -hmm. um, so if that's something you're interested in, I would talk to those organizations. It really depends on what their plan is and what they want to use it for. Um, as some of the taxidermists will actually uh, buy, it's a cape is what it's called once it's off the animal, um, especially on like mountain goat and sheep and things that are harder to get to. And um, if you do a good job of preserving it and not letting it spoil or slip and are able to get to them, they'll, they'll give you, you know, a couple hundred dollars depending on the species, uh, sometimes more. Um, usually what the most important thing to do is when you get it off, uh, there's going to be some meat and some fat left on it. Um, take your knife and get off as much of that as you can and spread it out and let it start drying out. Um, if that meat and fat is off, there's really not a lot left to spoil and it'll stay for several days that way. Thanks, Will. Um, someone's asking, is citric acid really needed for autumn caribou road or ATV hunting, for example, the Denali Highway? It's not. Um, if you're able to get back home and off the road system quickly and you're only doing a, a short hunt, um, it's, it's not a necessity. Um, I haven't used it very often myself because most of our hunts, once we get an animal down, we're coming back home that day or, you know, the next morning. Um, if you're doing something where we're going to be out a lot longer in the field um, or if it's earlier in the season when the bugs are really bad, then I would recommend it at that point. 
if it's cooler and the most of the flies that are dying down, then it's not as much of a concern. It's, it's mostly to keep the bugs off the meat. Good deal. Um, any suggestions on road hunting unit 14A? <laughs> and for those who, and for those who uh, don't know 14A. Yeah, uh, so 14A is the Palmer Wasilla area, um, all the way out towards Chickaloon. Also includes Point McKenzie um, up through Big Lake. And I hope most people realize just by listing that many towns in that area, there's a lot of private property. I mean, it's it's almost all private property along the roadways. So if you want to road hunt, find somebody who owns some land out there. And just go hunt their property. Um, I will say 14A, uh, we have several hundred moose a year are harvested in the fall but we have several thousand people a year hunt it. It's actually, for the number of moose harvested, it's really low success rates. Um, just there's so many people from Anchorage and from the Valley that hunt right there because it's so close and so accessible that there's a lot of pressure and a lot of hunters. So it's possible. Um, I've talked to people who have done it, but it's not very common. Um, okay, and there's a couple more. If folks need to, uh, it is just after eight, so if folks need to log off, that's fine. But um, do you have time, Will, for a couple more yeah, questions? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, this one is, is talking to a biologist the best way to learn general areas for where animals are located, or at least learn the type of habitat they'd be in, or other suggestions? Yeah, absolutely. I would start with, you know, if you have an area in mind, call in that area office and talking to the front desk staff. Um, that's what we do every single day for the entire year. A lot of people apologize for their questions, but like that's literally what I'm hired to do is talk to you about hunting. So I don't mind that at all. Um, and we can get you a really good start to things. Um, if you're interested in more specific details about, you know, exactly what the herd is doing um, or population trends, a lot more of those details, uh, then we can get you in touch with the biologist in charge of that, um, depending on you know, which herd you're looking at or which mountain range and different things. Um, we have different people in the offices who are managing them. Um, so like we have a sheep specific biologist, uh, Palmer has a carnivore specific biologist, we have caribou specific, um, and we can definitely get you lined out on who the right person to talk to is on that. Uh, if you call Anchorage asking them what the 40 mile caribou herd is doing, I can't tell you, I can say they're doing good, but that doesn't help you very much, but I can get you the emails of the biologists up in Token Fairbanks and you can start corresponding with them that way and they can help you out. Thanks, Will. Okay, and that I think to close out, there's two questions and they're the same. And it is, how do we get hands-on training for field dressing? Any suggestions there? Um, so find somebody who hunts a lot and uh, offer to go with them and to help learn and pack. Uh, everybody I know that hunts is more than willing to take somebody out and kind of mentor them or tutor them on doing that. Um, if that's not something that you're comfortable with if you just kind of want to be taught um, we have a couple different classes uh, through the website um, both through alaskans afield and becoming outdoors women that depending on how the rest of this year goes may or may not be happening i haven't kept up with the details on that um, but we do classes on big game skinning and field care and processing and things like that um, they're usually pretty limited um, because it's such an involved class there's not a lot of people that can sign up for it um, but it is an awesome class to go through. Um, also, we have a lot of taxidermists around. Um, they get a lot of animals in if you want to see how they process different hides and skulls and things like that. Um, I'm sure they'd be more than willing to show you, especially once things start slowing down here in a few more weeks. Yeah, and that's just kind of a touch and go subject right now with the outreach uh, programs that we have, as Will mentioned, with Alaskans Afield and Becoming an Outdoor Women and some of the HIT classes. So mm -hmm. um, I would just keep it, keep an eye on our online calendar to see what type of classes, if it's, you know, this virtual learning that we're doing currently, um, if we can do any uh, in-person classes in the future, but that is something that we know folks are interested in. So we have done hands-on field dressing of small game and big game. Um, so we know that you're interested and we're taking that in right now. So thanks for joining us, everybody. I think that uh, kind of wraps up our evening, but remember that um, there are some resources that I typed in the chat, a bunch of different links 
to various resources on electric fences to um, the videos about field dressing and also check back on YouTube and Vimeo. Just search Alaska Department of Fishing Game for this video and others. Thank you.